In this video, I'm going to show you 15 of the world's best optical illusions because they're amazing examples of how our brain sometimes gets things wrong. Visual illusions are a great reminder to ourselves that we don't see the world exactly how it is. We see the world how our brain perceives it. But that's not all you're getting in this video. We're also going to look at some fascinating examples of non-visual phenomena where our brain just gets it wrong time and time again. We're going to do a deep dive on three cognitive biases, issues that affect all of us, which can lead to very poor decision making, thanks to our brain. That's coming up, but let's jump right in to the world's best optical illusions. I find them fascinating, and I think you will too. Today, it's all about the brain. Let's begin with the Lilac Chaser. This illusion is over 20 years old and was created by Jeremy Hinton. It's a visual illusion that demonstrates colour adaptation. If you follow the dots around, you'll notice that the discs are simply disappearing for a split second. But if you focus on the plus sign in the centre, you'll see that the gap has been replaced by an after image of the opposite colour, in this case green. That image isn't actually there. Our brain has made it up. If you stare at the cross for over 20 seconds, you may experience a phenomena called Troxler's fading, where all of the dots disappear, seemingly mopped up by the green dot, which doesn't even exist. I leave it running for another 10 seconds. <laughs> example of Troxler's fading. Stare at the dot in the centre. The blue ring will eventually disappear. This visual illusion affects visual perception. Part of this illusion is to do with the construction of the eye, but part of the phenomena is due to misinterpretation by your brain. <laughs> Dancer. It's one of the most stunning visual illusions. Whether the spinning dancer is spinning clockwise or anti-clockwise depends entirely on how your brain is interpreting the image. This illusion derives from the lack of visual cues for depth. The crazy thing about this illusion is that it can switch directions at any moment. Sometimes looking away and then back at the screen can trigger this switch, but other than that you've got no control over it. Once you see the spinning dancer switch directions, it's not the video that's done that, it's your brain. I'll keep it running for 20 more seconds. If it hasn't worked for you, rewind it and have another go. Roger Shepard's tables. These tables by Roger Shepard are an example of geometrical illusion. They are stunning and the very best example of its type. What would you say is the longest table? The table tops are a pair of identical parallelograms and our brain interprets them as objects in three dimensional space. This one clearly looks longer and thinner than this one. They are, however, identical. I can show graphically by moving the large tabletop over and I can even use a ruler to show you that they are the same. If you don't believe me, pause this video and compare the length of your finger to both examples. Here's two examples of the Herman grid. In this first one, devised in 1870, your brain gets confused and puts blobs in the intersections. If you look directly at any individual blob, it disappears. The scintillating grid version was developed 120 years later. Dark dots pop up and disappear rapidly at random. That's why they call it scintillating. This is an example of illusory motion. Stare at this image. It's clearly moving. Now pick one individual dot and stare at it. You've made the image stop moving. This is due to the cognitive effects of interacting colour contrasts along with shapes and position. This is a YouTube video that you can control with your eyes. The Caffey Wall Illusion. These horizontal lines are perfectly level and straight, but that's not how your brain is interpreting it. The crazy thing is though, if we use exactly the same image with 
colours of lower contrast. Your brain can make sense of it. It was named the Café Wall Illusion by Richard Gregory in 1973. A member of his laboratory team noticed the effect on the wall tiles at their local café. Here's Richard in 2010 visiting that exact café. The impossible trident. It's got three legs at the bottom, but that makes no sense when you look at the top of the object. Our brains just can't make sense of this, which is why it's called the impossible trident. Can Isar's triangle? How many triangles can you see? I'll give you five seconds. The answer, of course, is zero. There's no triangles. Our brain has just made them up. The Checker Shadow Illusion was published in 1995 by Edward Edelson. Your brain is telling you that tiles A and B are different colours. They are, in fact, exactly the same colour and shade. Your brain can see the shadow and clearly expects a white tile to be in the space marked B. I'm going to slide the B tile now out of the shadow and put it next to A. I haven't changed the colour of that tile. Your brain has. Which is the longest horizontal line? I'll give you five seconds to work it out. Yep, yeah, you've guessed it. They're all the same. Motion blindness. Stare at the flashing green dot. The yellow dots will eventually disappear. They're still there on the video, but your brain will be blind to them. Which is the longest yellow line? The one at the top or the one at the bottom? I'll give you five seconds to work it out. They're both the same. Your brain is making that top one bigger as it perceives it as further away. And finally, here's the Ebbinghaus illusion. Which yellow circle is the largest? I'll give you five seconds to work it out. Yep, you guessed it. Our brain got it wrong again. They're both the same size. Now, from optical illusions to cognitive biases. We all have them, and understanding them can help to improve our decision-making. We're going to start with what is probably the most famous example of a cognitive bias, the Linda problem. I've got a question for you to think about and then we'll get on with the video. But first, I want to introduce you to Linda. This is Linda. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which of the following two options is more probable? One, Linda is a bank teller, or two, Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. I'll give you a moment to think about that. In fact, pause this video now and put your answer in the comments. On your shoulders is the most complex structure that we're aware of in the universe. The human brain, your brain, has got what is considered to be a virtually unlimited storage capacity. OK, let me be more specific. It's been estimated that the human brain has a storage capacity of 2.5 million gigabytes. That's the equivalent of 40,000 iPhones completely maxed out. The electrical impulses racing around your brain are enough to power a light bulb. Information travels around your brain at around 280 miles per hour. A tiny slither of your brain tissue, no larger than a grain of sand, contains around 100,000 neurons. So it's a pretty impressive thing that each and every one of us has. You have an impressive brain. But I'm sorry to say this, it's not perfect. In fact, it's far from perfect. It has biases, lots and lots 
of biases. The human brain version 1.0 has its issues. We do have cognitive biases, slight issues that we all share. There are literally hundreds of these biases that I could talk about in this video. But we haven't got all day, so I've picked three that I think are particularly noteworthy. In these three examples, we still make mistakes over and over again, even when we know what's happening. Even when we understand the cognitive bias, we still make the same mistakes. Three things that our brain just refuses to correct. Three reasons why we all need a brain upgrade to version 2.0. Conjunction fallacy sees human beings looking at two or more specific conclusions put together as more likely than a singular conclusion from that set. The probability of two events occurring together is always less than or equal to either event happening alone. It's absolute common sense. You can assign a probability of this channel achieving 25,000 subscribers by Christmas. The chances of this channel reaching 25,000 subscribers by Christmas and me getting exactly 10 Christmas presents on Christmas Day is statistically possible. It's not zero. The chances of both of those things, though, happening together are much lower than just one of those things happening. The probability of two or more options conjoined is never greater than the independent conjuncts. The most well-known example of conjunction bias was written by psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. It's called the Linda Problem. I asked my viewers about it on the community tab last week. Let's quickly look at it again. This is Linda. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Tversky and Kahneman then posited the following two options, asking which is more probable. One, Linda is a bank teller and two, Linda is a bank teller and active within the feminist movement. Now there is a chance that this 31 year old woman is a bank teller. It may be one in a thousand, it may be one in 10,000, but there is a chance. It's not zero. There's also a chance that she's active in the feminist movement. It's not zero. However, the chances of both of these things being true together are infinitesimally small. Typically around 80% of respondents to this question will answer number two. Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. We're asking which option is the most probable. So picking an option with two conjuncts defies logic. But something overtakes us. We automatically skip logic and make an emotional judgment. My audience is clearly smarter than the average population. When I asked this question on a community post, I had 251 respondents, 37% of whom chose option one. Linda is a bank teller. 63%, so almost two thirds, said that it was more probable that Linda was a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. As I say, my audience is smart, but two thirds of them picked the answer that was quite obviously less probable than the other because it contained two conjoined conclusions. There is a chance that Linda is a bank teller, but the possibility that Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement is far less likely. Tversky and Kahneman say that we're getting this wrong because option two seems more representative of Linda from the description that we've been given. Our brains seem to favor the representative heuristic when making probability judgments. It can be a useful shortcut, but it can lead us to making errors in judgment. We know when we stop and think about it that the probability of the conjunctions is never greater than its component parts. But initially we can't help making emotionally based judgments based on representativeness. If you got the Linda problem wrong when you first looked at it, I want to make you feel better. Stephen Gould was an American paleontologist, an evolutionary biologist and a science historian. In other words, he's nobody's fool. He said, I'm particularly fond of this example. I know that the conjoint statement is least probable, yet a little homunculus in my head continues to jump up and down shouting at me, but she can't just be a bank teller. Read the description. It seems no matter how much we try, our brains want to go with the emotional response, despite us really knowing that the most likely option contains no conjunctions. We can't help it. Now, I'm not the sort of YouTuber that ever wants to poke fun at his audience. But when I asked my audience to consider the Linda problem, some were moved enough to comment as well as give their answer. I'm not revealing the YouTube names to avoid any embarrassment, and I've now deleted the original post. So you can't go and check who said these things. If I'm about to read a comment that you made, 
please find it in your heart to forgive me. Because you're not alone. Emotional responses have been observed in dozens of studies. One viewer said, mathematically, it must be B. There's no option for her not being a bank teller. So being a bank teller is certain. There's a chance she's not a feminist. Well, no, that's correct. There's no option for her not being a bank teller. Just like there's no option for her not being a feminist. The question just asked, what is the most probable? bank teller or bank teller and feminist. This viewer is coming to a conclusion based on an option that isn't even there. One viewer picked the right answer, but for emotional reasons that they went on to explain. Only 39% for the top option, huh? The feminists are answering that one. Give me a break. One person apparently overcome with emotion and outrage even took offence at the question and told me that they refused to answer. I'm not at all comfortable with this. It's the kind of question that would appear on those Epoch Times ads, which in reality is a front for the Daily Express. The word has been demonised, and so it would be assumed that feminists are keen to go on marches because they like to complain. I'm not playing that game. Emotions allow us to completely miss the point at times. Let's remind ourselves that the question was about probability, with a perfectly logical answer available to the respondent. It seems that we just can't help ourselves. Maybe it was the word feminism that got in the way of the Linda problem. It's an emotive subject, and everyone has a view on it. In 1981, another study was completed amongst American policy experts. They they were split into two groups and asked to assign probabilities to things that might happen over the next 12 months. The first group were asked to evaluate the probability of the then USSR invading Poland and then the United States subsequently breaking off diplomatic ties with the USSR. This experimental group assigned the probability of this happening as a 4% chance. The second experimental group were asked to assign a probability of the US simply breaking off diplomatic relations with the USSR. That was assigned a 1% probability. So the first experimental group, given a more complex scenario with two conjuncts, which involved the USSR invading Poland, was judged to be four times more likely than the United States merely breaking off relations as considered by the second group. Obviously, the USSR invading Poland in 1981 may well have involved the United States breaking off diplomatic relations. But logic tells us that the probability of these two things happening together cannot be four times greater than either event happening individually. brain's taken a logical leap because of how we're interpreting the information that's given to us. We suspend critical thinking and come to a far more representative conclusion. Also in 1981, an experimental group was asked to assume that Beyond Borg would reach the men's final of Wimbledon. They were asked to rank the following outcomes based on probability. Borg will win the match. Borg will lose the first set. Borg will lose the first set, but win the match. Borg will win the first set, but lose the match. In this example, we've got two options with no conjunction and two options with conjunctions. It's not a particularly emotive subject and the respondents are given a certain amount of room to exercise judgment based on their tennis knowledge. But the respondents still chose a conjunction. Borg will lose the first set, but win the match was judged to be the most likely outcome. Despite the simple Borg will win the match being available and far more likely. If you thought that conjunction bias was a problem for the human brain, it's nothing compared to our next subject. Let's move away from Linda problems now and have a look at anchoring. is a psychological phenomenon where a human's judgment is influenced by a reference point. A reference point that can even be completely irrelevant. In numerical anchoring, it's been demonstrated that once that numerical anchor has been set, it can change the outcome of a person's decision making compared to if the anchoring point had never been introduced. Car salesmen have long understood the usefulness of anchoring and use it not only to drive sales, but to push up prices. For example, a car placed alongside a much more expensive car can make the potential buyer view it as more reasonable or even cheap, even if the sticker price is higher than the market value. Again, anchoring was first theorized by Tversky and Kahneman. One of the first studies carried out by them was to ask two groups of participants to compute the product of numbers multiplied together one through to eight. The second group was given the same problem, but reversed. They were only given five seconds to compute 
complete the challenge. That, of course, didn't give them enough time to complete the calculations in their heads. So they ended up estimating the answer. The group which started low to high had a median score estimate of 512. The group which started high to low had a median score estimate of 2,250. The answer, if you grab a calculator, is 40,320, regardless of which way you do it. The first number provided the anchor, and it affected their estimations once the five seconds were up. The group that started at one estimated the answer almost five times lower than the experimental group that started at eight. In another study, participants were asked to spin a Wheel of Fortune. This rigged reel was predetermined to stop on either 10 or 65, but in both cases, the participants were then asked a question. They were asked to estimate the percentage of African nations that made up the United Nations. The average answer for the group that stopped the wheel at 10 was 25%. They estimated that 25% of the United Nations was made up by African nations. The average answer for the group that stopped the wheel at 65 was 45%. Respondents were told that their Wheel of Fortune score had got nothing to do with the question that they were about to answer, but it didn't help them. One of the reasons that anchoring is a salesman's dream is that we all know why they're doing it. We know the game they're playing, but it still doesn't help us from being influenced by it. Another study was tried with two groups, and in both groups, they were given an anchor that was clearly bonkers. Group one was asked if Mahatma Gandhi died before or after the age of nine. The second group was asked if he died before or after age 140. Both ages given are clearly rubbish and everyone knew it. Both groups were then asked how old they thought he was when he died. The group given nine as an anchor answered 50 years old on average. The group who were given age 140 answered 67 years old on average when he died. So even though all participants knew that the numbers that they'd been given were preposterous, it still swayed their answers. For the record, he was assassinated at the age of 78. Other studies have gone further. One asked participants to guess how many physicians were listed in their local phone book. Participants were told that they were going to be exposed to an anchor. They were also told that being exposed to this anchor could contaminate their response. So they were asked to do their very best to correct for this. Every time the test was run, the experimental group reported higher estimates than the control group, who were given no anchor at all. It always works, and that fact is not lost on the world of commerce. And this next bias is not lost on the world of gambling. Please allow me just 15 seconds to plug this channel. Very Nearly Interesting is a brand new channel and I need all the help I can get. Please hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. That's how YouTube knows you like it and they'll show it to more people. And please consider subscribing. That way we might see you again. casino table in Monte Carlo in 1913 there had been a straight run of black numbers for 10 spins that's a rare event all of the punters there could tell that there was a red number in the air and they piled on the bets they could smell it they could taste it a red is clearly due Even people not playing that night rushed to the table. They knew that the chances of a run of 10 of the same colour was very small, and it is. Allowing for one green zero on the table, as it is in Europe, the chances of landing on a black is a 48.6% chance. The chances of it landing on a black 10 times in a row is 0.074%. The punters felt that it was an opportunity to print money. Everyone switched to red over the next few spins. Staking millions of francs. The run of blacks finally ended when 26 in a row had been clocked up. chances of 26 blacks in a row coming up that night was one in 66 million. But crucially, the ball didn't know that on each individual spin. Each spin was still a 48.6% chance of it being black, obviously. Everyone in the casino left there that night considerably poorer than before they went in. 
as they all fell victim to the Betters fallacy. It's the mistaken belief that something that does not depend upon the events of the past, happening more often than usual, will influence the outcome of future events. Those people in that casino were overcome by the Betters fallacy. Sure that a run of red was in the air, based solely on the fact that we'd had a long run of blacks. It's the same with the coin toss. After five heads in a row, we're more likely to call tails. We're perfectly well aware that the coin has got no idea what the previous results were, yet we begin to believe that tails must be due. The Betters fallacy says, I'm due. Even on games of complete chance, flipping a coin onto heads 21 times in a row has a probability of 2 million 97,152. But once we're at that point, the chances of a coin flip onto heads, that individual flip, is still one in two. But still our brains won't accept it. It's a deep-seated cognitive bias. Apparently there is hope for us with the Betters fallacy. With age, experience and the ability to consider each event as independent, we can actually greatly improve our decision-making skills. That's unlike the great majority of biases where there's absolutely no hope for us at all. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please click the like button. That way, YouTube will show it to more people. And please consider subscribing. That way, we might see you again. And have a look at some of our other content. There's loads of interesting things on there. Well, very nearly interesting.